And my voice has given me some fits, but hopefully it's going to last. Um, <clears throat> some of you if, you, if you grew up in the United States, you probably, maybe even outside the United States, there was a very popular series of movies that came out in the 1980s called Indiana Jones. Um, <clears throat> and when I was working on this sermon, this scene from Indiana Jones came to my mind. I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. But in 1989, there was a movie called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which I think was probably one of the best of the series. And the story is Indiana Jones was an archaeologist. He was looking for old things. And his father was also an archaeologist. And Indiana Jones had gotten word that his father was looking for the Holy Grail. Now, the Holy Grail was the cup that Jesus drank from. And the movie is set in the 1940s, and, and it, it, apparently the Nazis, the bad, bad people, were trying to get the Holy Grail too. And so there's this race to try to find the Holy Grail. And so it all culminates at a temple in an area called Petra, which is a, a real place, and Indiana Jones is, uh, him and his father have gotten there, but the Nazis have shot his father. And his father's lying on the ground and, and dying, but Indiana Jones is hoping if he gets the grail, he can get his father healed because the grail promised eternal life. I just thought of that, that scene because if you, if you heard there, he kept saying, the penitent man will pass. He was reading his dad's journal, the penitent man will pass. At the last second, he thought, what does the penitent man do? He kneels before God. And I just kept thinking about that. And he might be, what does that word penitent mean? It just means to feel regret. It means to feel sorrow over something. And it means that you're willing to change. <clears throat> Another word would be repentance. It is feeling regret. It's feeling sorrow. And it's like, I want to change my behavior. And, you know, we've been in this series called Kingdom Attitudes. How should we as believers think? How should we act as believers? And, and just to remind you, what we talked about is if you're in the kingdom of God, in, in other words, again, you have to put your faith and trust in Christ to be in God's kingdom. If you have done that, you are in God's kingdom. But that doesn't mean we just sit around and, oh, I'm, in, I'm going to heaven. No, 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 no. We need to have some attitudes that characterize our life. One of it is we need to stay persistent in our prayer life. Because even when you're in the kingdom of God, life is still tough. We still have trials. We still have struggles. And so we need to be consistent and persistent in our prayer. And also another attitude that you and I need to have is one of humility. The way you get into God's kingdom is humble yourself before God. And the way you and I keep walking with the Lord is in humility. God listens to the prayer of the humble. He listens to the prayer of the humble. And so even if you're a follower of Jesus, and I hope everyone is, we should all always walk in humility because we're all fallen people and we still struggle. And none of us is better than anybody else. We may have different backgrounds and different cultures, but we're all the same. <laughs> we're all created in God's image. And humility needs to characterize our lives. Also trust. We need to trust our Heavenly Father. And sometimes, I get it, that's a struggle. But we talked about when we went through that, that Jesus fulfilled prophecy about him. And we know we can trust him because everything that he said would happen, happened. And he's told us things are going to happen in the future, and we can trust that to happen. And another characteristic is faith. We walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. Right? We believe God's there. We believe there's heaven. We look at the evidence and say, I believe it, but I haven't been there yet. Have you? No. But I believe it's there. And I believe God's there. And so we walk by faith when sometimes things don't make sense. Well, I want to look at another thing that needs to characterize us. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke 19, it's a very, very familiar story. I thought about making you sing the song. You may have known the song if you grew up in um, Sunday school. Zacchaeus was a 
wee little man. So you might know that one. A wee little man was he. One day he climbed the sycamore tree to see all he could see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. Y'all know that one? And he said, Zacchaeus, come on down, for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. Anybody heard that song? Okay, some of y'all, some of you are like, I have no idea. <laughs> Well, a lot of us grew up singing that song, and it's based on this story. And let's just take a look at it for just a second. So Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, and he entered into Jericho. We talked about that last week. Jericho was, was outside of Jerusalem, about 15 miles, I believe, outside Jerusalem. It was where Herod had built his winter palace. It had freshwater springs. It was known as the city of palm trees. The wealthy went to Jericho. So it was a very place with a lot of wealthy people. And so last week we saw that Jesus met Bartimaeus, the beggar, before he entered Jericho. Now he's in Jericho and going through Jericho. And so he's passing through the town, and there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now again, the tax collectors were Jews, but they tended to work for the Romans, and the Romans let them collect more money than the Romans needed, than Rome was offering. And so the tax collectors, maybe you really owed the government 10%, but when the tax collector, he would charge you 12%. And he kept the 2%. Okay? Now, if you're in a town with a lot of rich people and you're overcharging, what is that going to make you? Probably rich too. So tax collectors, the Jews, the, the, the common people hated the tax collectors. They felt they were traitors, betrayers. They didn't like them. They, they, they figured they were like, you know, you had prostitutes and you had tax collectors. They were like the worst in their view. So there's this man, Zacchaeus. He is a chief tax collector. So he's over the other tax collectors. And he's very rich. And so... He was trying to see who Jesus was. So Jesus is coming to town, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. Though he was a short guy. I don't know how tall he was. But he couldn't see over the crowd. Now, would you say that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus? Yeah, he wanted to see who is this man, Jesus. And, and the question is, was he willing to go the extra mile. Well, look at what he did. So running ahead, so he's running ahead of the crowd, he climbed up in a sycamore tree, which again, those trees grew in nice warm environments, and that's what Jericho was. Grew, climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. So would you say he wanted to see Jesus? Yes. He was desperate. He wanted to see him. He was willing to climb up in a sycamore tree and to try to see Jesus. And you know, when I thought about it, when we look at people in, in the Gospel of Luke where we've been, I see that thread all the time. That there were people who were desperate to see Jesus. Just the story last week, Bartimaeus. He's on the side of the road and he's like, who's passing by? And they say, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And what does he start doing? Son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. What did the crowd say? Be quiet. What does he do? Son of David, <laughs> he's desperate. Back earlier in Luke chapter 8, there, there was a woman who had a bleeding issue, if you remember that story. And there was a crowd of people surrounding Jesus. And she's like, if I can just touch his garment. And so she fights through the crowd just to touch Jesus because she was desperate. There was the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> and there's a Pharisee having a dinner party at his house. And this woman crashes the party and pours perfume all over Jesus' feet and wipes his feet with her hair. She was desperate. She didn't care that it was a Pharisee's house. She wanted to see Jesus. When I think about the ten lepers in Luke 17, they're yelling out to Jesus, have mercy on us. They Have mercy on us. They're desperate to see Jesus. I see this pattern over and over, people who were desperate to see Jesus. Now, do you think, well, I would ask, 
Do you think that Zacchaeus was willing to be mocked a little bit because he wanted to see Jesus? I think so. Can you imagine the tax collector up in the tree? Can you imagine what people were saying? Look at that. There's an IRS agent up there. Somebody must have sicked a dog on him. I had to run up a tree. I'm sure there were people laughing at Zacchaeus because I'm sure he was known and mocking him. But he didn't care. He wanted to see Jesus. And so look at what happened. <clears throat> so when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Now when I read that, I thought, how did Jesus know his name? Maybe somebody told him. I kind of don't think they did. <clears throat> I think that probably caught Zacchaeus by surprise. And instead of making fun of Zacchaeus, because here's this tax collector in a tree, <clears throat> he's like, hey, come on down, because I want to eat at your house. In fact, you'll notice he said, it is necessary for me to eat at your house. I thought, why would he say, I have to eat at your house? This is necessary for me to eat at your house. Like I told you last week, the crowd and even the disciples, the apostles, did not understand that Jesus had to go to the cross. Even though he kept telling them, it just went over their heads. And the crowd thought, we're going to Jerusalem and all those Old Testament prophecies are going to be fulfilled and Jesus is going to throw off the Romans and set up his kingdom and this is going to be awesome. That's why they wanted the beggar to be quiet. Let's just keep moving. And I can imagine when Jesus said, hey, I need to go to your house today, a lot of people in the crowd's like, oh, another stop. But you see, the crowd and even the disciples did not understand Jesus' mission. Look at verse 10, because Jesus tells us what his mission was. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was Jesus' mission. Zacchaeus was a lost man. He was a tax collector. He was a, he was a lost man. And Jesus' mission was to seek and save people who were lost. And, and here's the thing, though, about Zacchaeus and, and other people. He was seeking Jesus. He wanted to go up in the tree. He wanted to see who he was. He was willing to even maybe be mocked because he wanted to know about Jesus. A few weeks ago, we, we talked about humility and God responds to those who are humble. And, and I, I, again, I think this took a little bit of humility for Zacchaeus. He had to let go of his pride. He had to run up into that tree because he wanted to see Jesus. And God responds to us when we're walking in humility. And, and again, he, he, Zacchaeus didn't really care what people thought about him. He just wanted to see Jesus. So Jesus says, yes, today it's necessary. I need to go to your house because I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. And look what Zacchaeus does. <clears throat> so he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. And all who saw it, look at this, the crowd's reaction. All who saw it began to complain. He is going to eat and stay with a sinful man. Again, they didn't get it. They didn't understand that Jesus' mission is to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen, as a church, we must always remember that our mission is to carry out Christ's mission to seek and to save those who were lost. A lot of churches have forgotten their mission. Their big social clubs or their performing arts centers. And you know what? I think you can tell by people's attitudes and actions in the church whether they know the mission or not. 
And I've seen this, and maybe you've seen this. I hope you haven't been guilty of this. But if you, if you find yourself saying, we don't want those people to come to our church, you've forgotten the mission, Amen. right? Amen. You've forgotten the mission. Again, the mission is to reach people with the gospel, even if they don't look like us. And look, our mission is to reach all people, gay, straight, trans, queer, black, white, brown, rich, poor, healthy, sick, doesn't matter. Our mission is to reach all people. Now, let me say this. There's a flip side to this. There's a movement today in America that's picking up steam, especially with the young people, millennials and Gen Zs. And by the way, the Gen Z population, generation, is larger than the baby boomers. So you know how much the baby boomers have influenced our country. Think what Gen Z is going to do in 10 years. And a lot of them are buying into a new movement of quote-unquote Christianity called progressive Christianity. And progressive Christianity is attracting a lot of young people. And what it's saying is we need to embrace people of all different backgrounds. I get that. But they go a step further and they say, we need to affirm you. Well, there's a difference here. We should be welcoming all people. But we cannot affirm people in their sinful lifestyles. Jesus didn't affirm people who were living in sinful lifestyles. He didn't tell the, the prostitute who was putting perfume on his feet and wiping her with hair, hey, you're cool, go ahead and keep on doing what you're doing. He didn't say that to her. You know, he never affirmed people who were living in sin. And that's, the, that's, that's a big, the big problem with progressive Christianity. In fact, most of the time when I see the word progressive, it's really regressive because most of the people that are progressive are preaching immorality to be normal. And, and so, but this is a big movement now, progressive Christianity. I'm all for everybody should be welcome, but we cannot affirm people in sin. We need to call people to repentance because that was Jesus' mission, to seek and to save those who are lost. And and so Zacchaeus has this encounter with Jesus. And let me say this, when you have an encounter with Jesus, it will lead to repentance. When you have an encounter with Jesus, it will lead to repentance. Now you say, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of your attitude and your actions from sin to obedience to God. It's a change in your thinking. It's a change in your attitude away from sin. You say, I want to turn from my sin to God. I want to walk in repentance. In the Old Testament, repentance was pictured by weeping over their sins. A lot of times in the Old Testament, they would wear sackcloth, which was really itchy, uncomfortable clothing to signal repentance from sin. They they would often tear their garments in moments of repentance. They would make restitution for wrong. Now, I'm not saying you have to rip your clothes or wear sackcloth. But what I am saying is there's some sort of response to encounter with Jesus. Repentance results in changed behavior. It results in change. When a person is truly repentant, there is changed behavior. And again, here's the thing. A lot of people say, I'm a Christian. But their behavior is no different than a non-Christian. And Jesus says, by their fruit, you'll know them. And it's really confusing if you tell me you're a Christian, but you're living like a non-Christian. I don't know what you are. And when we're a Christian, we should be different in how we behave. There should be changed behavior. I was going to show you a video clip, but I'm going to, just for time's sake, skip it. But again, there's so many testimonies out there. And I hope your testimony is one of changed behavior, that your life has been changed. 
And, and, and so look at what happens. Keep going. So Zacchaeus stood there and he said to the Lord, so he has this encounter with Jesus. And when you encounter Jesus, there's always repentance. And look what he does. Lord, look, I'll give a half of my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Now, in the chapter before Luke 18, we looked at another person that was very rich. If you remember that story from a few weeks ago, it was a rich young ruler. Remember that story? He too had a meeting with Jesus. He came up to Jesus. And he's like, hey, Lord, Master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Remember that story? And he said, I've kept the commandments. And he listed off the commandments he'd kept. And Jesus said, go and sell everything you have. <laughs> now, do you get saved by selling off everything you have? No, that's not how you get saved. What was Jesus saying to him? You've got to let go what's most important in your life. Because that's what happens for repentance. Yeah. To repent, you have to let go of your pride. Yeah. You have to let go of whatever sin is in your life. You have to let go of it. For this rich young ruler, the most important thing to him was his wealth. Yeah. And if you know the story, he wasn't willing to let go of it. Said he went away sad. Even though Jesus gave him an invitation, follow me. He left, and as far as we know, he never followed Jesus. I wonder where he's at today. I imagine those words are constantly ringing through his mind. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, is like, I will, I will give away whatever. If I have hurt somebody, I will pay them back four times. And again, he's volunteering to do this. Jesus isn't telling him. He's volunteering. Why? Because there was a change. Now... <clears throat> I think what happens is when he came down, they, Jesus says it's necessary to go to the house. I think you're getting a glimpse of the conversation in the house after Zacchaeus had spent time with Jesus. And he had that encounter and he said, whoa, woe is me. I repent. I'm going to change my life because he had had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus... <clears throat> says, is very kind to him. And this is something I think is something we need to remember a lot. Jesus didn't affirm Zacchaeus in what he did. Zacchaeus was convicted of his sin. And as a result, he repented. And you know, I thought of this passage. Because I think one of the problems today in, in progressive Christianity, lots of problems with it, but we got to affirm you in the, a sin. No. We never affirm people in their sin, but we still love them, right? We still love them. Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house to eat. That was a scandal. But he loved Zacchaeus. And I thought of this passage, and Paul said in Romans chapter, tw uh, chapter 2, he says, every one of you who judges is without excuse. <clears throat> For when you judge another, you condemn yourself since you, the judge, do the same things. He's getting on to believers who are judging people as if they're somehow superior. He said, now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. God will judge people on the truth. Don't worry about that. Do you think any of one of you who judges who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? And then this was the verse that I really want you to see. Or do you despise the riches of his kindness? restraint and patience not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance as a church we should be welcoming to people who are seeking and we should be kind to them and love them with the goal that they come to Christ I'm glad that God's been kind to me aren't you because there's probably a lot of times that if I were God, I would have zapped myself. Psh, you're done. But I'm glad that God is kind and leads us to repentance. And, and so, again, we need to be a church that welcomes all, but at the same time, we don't leave people in their sin. Jesus came to seek and to save 
those who were lost. We need to share the gospel with the world. What's the gospel? God so loved the world. In this way, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Y'all, we have to remember this. And this is a challenge to all of us. When we see people who don't look like us, who don't act like us, who are living lifestyles different than what the Bible teaches, remember, they're lost. Okay? So many times they're lost. And you and I, the last thing they need is for us to come up there and start hitting them over the head. They need us to love them and tell them, Jesus loves you. God loves you. God, God died for you. He's what you're seeking. He's what you're searching for. And, and, and I think that's something we need to remember. I, Dad, can you throw that video clip on there? I just want you to watch this little clip. Because we need to remember people are searching I attended the Ramtha School of Enlightenment, which is in eastern Washington. Um, we practice and learn all sorts of occult practices like remote viewing and uh, telepathy and uh, specific kinds of meditation and things like that. I become um, a sound healer. There was something in me that felt disconnected and I really felt that I had something oppressive um, in my, or negative in my energy field. So I contacted this woman and we arranged to do a session over the phone. I spent four hours with her on the phone, getting all sorts, sorts of strange impressions. At one point I thought that something was in the room with me and it didn't feel good and I, I honestly didn't know and I even said to her, I said, I don't know if I'm making all this up. I don't know if I believe that any of this is real. The, you know, how, I, I had no idea what I had gotten myself into, basically. We, we did this until it was clear that there was, she couldn't help me. So that night, I go to bed, I try to go to sleep, and I, I don't know how to describe it now. I've experienced what I would call spiritual attacks before, but this was so intense, and it was like, I would call it a, like a psycho-spiritual attack. It was like I unleashed something in my mind. Um, every time I closed my eyes, I mean, it was like I was seeing snakes um, come at me, you know, loud voices, words. I just, I was being attacked in a way that um, I couldn't control, I couldn't stop, and I had never experienced before. And it, and it was so frightening. And I just tossed and turned, I was being tormented and for hours until finally I decided to get up out of my bed and go lay down on the couch. And by this time it was like six o'clock in the morning and I finally fell asleep for a couple of hours. But anyway, I woke up in the morning and the only thing that I could think to do that I felt um, would be helpful would, would be to get a Bible. So I went to Barnes and Nobles and I bought a Bible. And I very earnestly began to read it um, from the beginning in Genesis. And that lasted for about two or three weeks until I wanted to take it and throw it against the wall because it just, it brought up everything, all the resistance that I had accumulated from my whole life of my, my belief system about, you know, the Bible doesn't make any sense. The Bible is stupid. The Bible's antiquated. It's superstitious. It's, you know, everything that I had somehow picked up, um, you know, from my parents, from our culture, from movies, from things I listened to. It was just all, it, it just, it brought up such an anger and a resistance in me that I just set the Bible aside and I said, no, that, I'm not doing that. So what I decided to do in, in my own strength and my own will was to double down on my, what I knew and what I had um, spent basically my lifetime pursuing, which was my form of spirituality. So I started really immersing myself back in, in this um, whole we create our own reality kind of philosophy. But then, I don't know, after a few months, I started doing some, uh, some meditations. Uh, there was one time specifically, I don't remember the video topic or whatever, but I was doing a video and I kind of heard this voice in my, my head say, it's the blind leading the blind. And I just started to really question the guys that I was following and the information that I was following and the information that I was sharing. I started to feel like a fraud and question if what I was talking about was really, if I really believed it and if it was really meaningful and if it was really helpful. But I really, I started to question and I started to become suspicious of, of myself. I just became increasingly um, depressed. I, I felt 
sad and hopeless and helpless and but so these things I have been dealing with these things for the last six months uh, to a year and so they, they were all weighing down on me and I was just feeling helpless and hopeless and at night I would be downstairs in this house that we lived in I would be crying and I just I just felt so miserable I was even having suicidal thoughts and and thoughts that I knew were not my own so so it got to the point where I was so desperate that one night by myself downstairs crying I cried out to God and I and I just I, because I was so desperate I had nothing else and I said God Jesus I don't even believe you're real but if you are I need you and I need you now and that was basically my plea and I meant it with every cell of my being and I know that I was visited by the presence of Jesus I felt his presence all around me I didn't see him but I felt him I, I felt him come into the room his presence filled the space i'm getting chills when i talk about it now and i and i knew it was jesus so i felt his presence and it was so loving and so encompassing and in just a matter of moments he just showed me and revealed to me my life and all the decisions and choices and things i had been doing that i thought were spiritual and good and you know i'm a good person and my intention you know all these things that i was involved in that they were what brought me to this point and that I didn't know God at all, that I had actually been very defiant against God, that I, that I had done things that were abominable to him, that I, I um, was blasphemous, that I, that I had done things in direct contradiction to who God really is. And it was so remarkable because what happened is there was no resistance to this. I mean, he, he was there, he showed it to me and I, it was so clear, it was so clear how arrogant and ignorant I had been and I felt so much remorse and a true repentance. And, and this is how I know that this experience was so real because I didn't even know what repentance was. I didn't know that this is what really needs to happen to be born again. I didn't, I didn't understand any of this. I just know that in that moment, my heart turned, my being turned and that everything was different from that moment for me. I told my husband, what happened I started watching you know test other testimonials which I didn't even know existed on on the internet um, and that really helped confirm for me what was happening and I anyway so I shared with my husband everything was happening we started going to church thank God so much that he revealed himself to me when he did because if I didn't know the true God right now I would be um, even more frightened and more confused and so when Jesus says that I am the way the truth and the life it is true the reason I wanted to share that, amen. The reason I wanted to share that is you never know what's going on in a person's heart. Right? And that's why we need to love them and share with them the gospel and show them the kindness that leads to repentance. Because you never know. This lady was involved in the occult and all sorts of occultic practices. And it, it took many years. But there came a point when she realized there was an emptiness there. And she talked about her repentance. And so again, same with Zacchaeus. And again, like Paul said, it, it's not our business to judge outsiders. God takes care of that. Don't worry about that. Show them kindness that leads to repentance. And so Zacchaeus repented. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. And again, remember that Jesus' mission is to seek and to save those who are lost. And that should be our mission, church. And when we're out about with people, when you're at work, working with folks, again, if you know Christ, you should have your antennas up. And you should share the gospel when those opportunities are there. And they, they're watching you, how you live, how you talk, how you deal with adversity. They're watching you. And so they're wanting to know, are you for real? And so I challenge you to share the gospel when you're out there. Let people see Christ in you. And if there's sin in your life today, even if you're a believer, look, believers, we can still sin. And sometimes we can harbor sin in our life, which hurts our relationship with Father. And so if you're harboring sin in your life, again, repent. Because one of the attitudes that we need to live is an attitude of repentance. 
That's why Brother Jerome, he leads in our prayer in the morning. He read Psalm 51. That's an, a psalm of repentance. And we, we should be repentant. All of us sin. Hopefully sin less. But beyond the last, sometimes we still sin. We should always be willing to repent and turn from that sin and not live in that sin. So are you living in repentance? Are you willing to be like Zacchaeus? Are you willing to seek after Christ? Let's pray. Father, I pray, first of all, if there's someone here online or this morning watching, maybe they're desperately seeking. The gospel is they need to humble themselves, turn from their sin, and turn to you and trust you. And maybe there's somebody in this room today that needs to call out to you and say, Lord, save me. I want to turn from that sin in my life. I want to turn and trust you. And for those of us who are believers, who have repented, may we continue to live in repentance. May we not allow sin to grip our lives. May we continue to walk in faith and trust and confession and repentance. And Father, I pray that we will continue to have those incredible encounters with Jesus. And so, Father, we just pray this morning that we'll have those kingdom attitudes in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.